The Lord's given us another day, and it's good that you're here. The uh, opportunity to stand before you is a fantastic opportunity. It's like courting. You're nervous as can be, but you wouldn't change it. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse uh, 23 through 25 read, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The assembly has not been forsaken by those in front, and I'm thankful for that. We'll pray for those that aren't here, their travels today. I'm glad that each and every one of you are here. A couple of days ago, we had the chance to share with the world, at least the country or those neighbors that we have around us, the need of the birth of Christ. Two days ago, we had people, the majority, I'm sure, were probably more interested in our Savior than they are today. A couple of days ago, they had a need, and the need was to acknowledge the birth of our Savior. And we need to be thankful for that day. A couple of days ago, we had people coming out wanting to talk to us about the man that died on the cross that gave us the opportunity of salvation. We didn't have to go digging the doors to talk about Jesus a few days ago, did we? Jesus has been followed for the wrong reasons before. Do you recall that Jesus is feeding so many people? John chapter 6. And they came up to find him and he was gone and his apostles had went across the sea to the other side and Jesus had made it there too and when another boat came they got in and went across to seek him and find him. Do you recall that when they got over there they found Jesus and they were talking to Jesus and Jesus says you don't seek me because of the miracles and signs that you see. You seek me because of the food that fills your bellies. Stop seeking the food that perishes but seek the bread of life. Isn't it fantastic that Jesus was able at that moment to preach Jesus to them? They came out, they came to him for the wrong reasons, but Jesus was able to speak to them about Jesus, about salvation, about heaven. Every time this season comes around, I try to re-motivate myself to study and be prepared for the needs and the conversations that may be delivered. And I got my strength this year from Philip. You remember Philip? Acts chapter 8. Philip was sent to the desert road coming down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And he was told to meet the eunuch, the chariot on the road. And when he saw the chariot coming, he went up and he met the chariot and he heard the eunuch's uh, reading from the prophet Isaiah. You remember that Philip asked, do you understand what you read? And the eunuch said, how can I unless someone guides me? They read Isaiah, and from that moment forward, Philip was able to preach Jesus and him crucified. Wouldn't it be fantastic to have the ability to pick up where somebody is and preach Jesus and him crucified? We don't know where we're at in life. We don't know where the individual that comes in front of us is at in life. But wouldn't it be terrific if we had the ability to start from that moment and preach Jesus and him crucified? Because that is where we need to be. Jesus had two births. You realize, I'm sure. He was born of the mother Mary. And Revelation 1.5 says he was the firstborn of the dead. We love the fact that Jesus was born. We love even more the fact that he was born again. Because it's because he was born again that we have the opportunity of heaven one day. And it's the reason we sit here together this morning. So when you're given the opportunity for Christmas, as I've seen a lot of people do, they start shying away because they don't want to respect the birth of Jesus. The Bible doesn't say it, and we've acknowledged that with several people we've talked. The Bible doesn't permit us to celebrate the birth of Jesus. We're to celebrate Jesus every day. So let's not, not celebrate Jesus on the day that the rest of the world does. And be ready to preach Jesus and him crucified. Now if you were here at 10 o'clock, you were able to sit in class, and you've opened the book on 1 Samuel chapter 7. 
You'll agree with me that Alan does a good job in opening the word and shedding light on scriptural truths. You'll agree with me that Alan does a good job in giving the class the opportunity to iron out things that are laying on the hearts of those in the class. We're thankful for men like Alan and women that are able to take and open the book and teach and study and provide the time that it takes. Malachi 3.6 is a fact that I've used many times to talk to people. Malachi chapter 3, God says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. For the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Billy read for us this morning that Hebrew, Romans 15, 4, that the Old Testament is for our learning. Because God has not changed. So we'll open up and we'll discuss 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 3. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve him alone. And he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the sons of Israel moved the Baals and the Ashtaroth and served the Lord alone. Samuel is spoken of here for the first time, you remember, since chapter 4. Samuel stepped up in chapter 4 at the beginning of chapter 4. And Samuel brought the word to Israel. And Israel went out in battle against the Philistines and suffered a great loss. From then on, Samuel's taken and laid back. He hasn't been spoken of since. He hasn't stepped in back into the picture. When Israel took that great loss to the Philistines, Israel come back and what did they do? Israel came back and they went and got the Ark of the Covenant. They knew they needed God, didn't they? They come back and they got the Ark of the Covenant. Why did they get the Ark of the Covenant? They misunderstood. Israel was after a fixed image. They were after God, but they still hadn't got it yet. They were after a fixed image. They were after something in front of them that they could put their hands on, something uh, made, something uh, physical that they could rely on, that they could see, that they could depend on uh, with their own eyes rather than with spiritual prayer. They come back and got the Ark of the Covenant. They did it for right reasons. That Ark of the Covenant has won a many a battle, hasn't it? That Ark has been carried a many a battle, and it has won many a battle. But the Israel lights lost again. Have we ever faced a battle and we misunderstood how to approach the battle? Israel's had opponents. God's people have had opponents from the very beginning. You remember Adam and Eve, they, they suffered the temptation of Satan to redirect their thoughts and understandings of what God has already told them. The Israelites have faced the Philistines from the very beginning. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, when they were being led out of Egypt, it said that God, as he was leading them out, didn't take them by the way of the Philistines, even though it was near, because he didn't want them to see war and fear and return back to Egypt. The Israelites have been in Egypt for 400 years plus. And God had to re reroute them because he didn't want them to go through the land of the Philistines and face war and be scared. They have been facing the battle of the Philistines for quite a while. God's people have had opponents the entire time. And it's no different today, is it? Each and every one of us faced opponents this week. Each and every one of us had struggles this week. And I shy to say that most of us probably didn't drop to our knees in prayer. Most of us probably handled it the way we've always handled it. We took it on ourselves, and we tried to fix it ourselves. How fantastic would it be to bring God into every th problem that we have? I've had arguments before and comment getting made by God. And then all of a sudden you realize it's by God. 
that we're going to win this battle. Jesus stood, Jesus suffered. So we had an opportunity to win the battle. The Philistines, when they went after the ark, they went after physical item. They went after something that they could grab a hold of. Have we ever been in the position to where God is in within these walls as far as we're concerned? Have we ever been in a position to where the image of the cross is where God's at? Or the book that we hold in our hand? Have we ever been in that position? If it's unused, if it's used improperly, not right, if it's used wrongly, these walls, the image of the cross, the book that I hold in my hand is nothing more than a pile of expensive paper and ink. Just like the Ark of the Covenant was nothing more than a box. The Israelites knew they needed God. The Israelites were facing their Philistines again. They went out to battle the Philistines with God as far as they were concerned. They didn't do it with God's approval and they did it improper. The battle was lost. You remember? You remember as they go on that they return home sad, beat down, and confused. How many times have we tackled a, an argument or a, a confrontation or a discussion with the, the written word? How many times have we thrown it on the table to prove our point? And we get nowhere. We don't understand. The Israelites come back beaten down. They lost the ark. They don't know what to do. They had nothing left to do. As you go through, the ark makes it back to the Israelites, doesn't it? God's not done. He taught the Israelites a lesson, didn't he? Have we ever been taught a lesson? Have we ever been humbled enough to sit back and learn a lesson from what we've been taught? The Israelites had no more. They couldn't do anything else. They had reached their limit. They had not, their, their tether was gone. The ark ended up making it back around. You remember in chapter 6, the ark made it back into camp. Now, as I read chapter 6 and I read about how the ark made it back into camp, it reminded me of, of the things. It fixed itself. It came back. The ark came back. They didn't have to go battle. They didn't have to go fight. They didn't have to go pray and, and fall on their knees. They, they came back to the camp. Have you ever fixed something that was broken and you didn't do anything? I do that at work every once in a while. I unplug my air hose and plug it back up a few times, and all of a sudden my suspension's working. Alan's done that several times. Made me just, but he knows why it's working. I don't. I unplug and I plug and I unplug and I plug. Have you ever done that with a piece of equipment? You turn it on and off? Have you ever done it and it starts working? And how, how excited, Casey? You'd probably wish that happened many times. You walk in and they're done. They're back, they're back ready. But the Israelites didn't do that. The Israelites weren't satisfied when the ark. You know what they did at the beginning of chapter 7? The beginning of chapter 7, the Israelites. Uh, verse 2, from the day of the ark remained at Kareth, Jerum. The time was long and it was for 20 years. And the house of all of, all of Israel lamented after the Lord. They lamented. They understood. They mourned. They grieved. Israel grieved. They knew. They knew the battle was the Lord's. The ark is back. They understand that they're to submit to God. They understand that they're to fall to God. And that they're to grieve, to mourn for God. God's back. God hasn't left them. Neither does God leave us. When people call me at work and they want something ordered, a part ordered, or they want something taken care of, and I don't get it done in a time. I've had a truck over there for two months, building a truck bed on a truck for two months. When they don't get it back in the time frame that they want, they start fussing at me. Well, my instinct is the fuss what caused it. Right? It's not my fault. It's the fault of the one that didn't provide what I needed. My metal was supposed to have been there two weeks ago. It just showed up today. How am I supposed to get a bed done? So I tell my vendor, I let my vendor know. Because you can't do your job and do your job right. I'm getting fussed at. I can't have this. If you want to keep my business, you're going to have to get better at your job. What a shame it is that I'm not mature enough to back off and listen for the opportunity that I have to respect God and show God the love that he's shown me. The Israelites did. The Israelites, they mourned. 
When they come back into the camp, they mourned. And then Samuel stepped back into the scene here. Samuel's ready to tell them what they need to hear. Why? Because Israel's ready to hear. Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, Return to the Lord with all your heart. Remove the foreign gods and the asterisks from among you and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve him alone. And he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the sons of Israel moved the Baals and the Ashtaroth and served the Lord God alone. What do we hear when we hear that God got served alone? That's all they did, wasn't it? Can we, in the 21st century, serve God alone? How many times have you sat down and told, Well, Lord, you don't understand. I've got bills to pay. I've got customers calling. I've got employees that need covered. I've got meetings that I've got to make. You'll get the time that I've got left. And probably in our arrogance, we tell him you'll be thankful for the time you get. It's a scary fact when you talk to the God of salvation, when you talk to the God of heaven and you tell God of heaven that you'll be thankful. I've done it. I've regretted it and I've grown from it, Lord willing. The Israelites here put their Baals and their gods, their foreign gods away, their Ashtaroths. They put them all away and they served the God alone. Can we do that today? Can we put away the things that get in our way for God? What is the foreign gods of us today? Do we have idols? Do we have things that are getting in our way of God? You bet it. Every one of us do. Every one of us do. Anything that gets in the way of God for us has become our idol. We justified it. I've justified it several times. I've told the story once before Sidney was born. I wanted to take and pull my offering a little bit from church because I needed to finance the young lady. She's going to be expensive. She was born. A year and a half went by. It wasn't as expensive as I thought. So what did I do? I went and bought a good car, a Buick Enclave. I had more money. Isn't it a shame how we can justify the way we walk? And I carried that for quite a while, didn't I? That enclave stayed under me for quite a while until I realized that I took from the Lord and put under me. What do we do to take from God? What do we put under us? What do we satisfy? What do we have in time, energy, or satisfaction that belongs to God? The Israelites put away everything. And they served God alone. And God told him what he was going to do, didn't he? Samuel said, you do that, and he'll fight you Philistines. Then Samuel spoke, let's see, five. Then Samuel said, gather all of the house of Israel to Mitzvah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. They gathered at Mitzvah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said, there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the sons of Israel at Mitzvah. Now when the Philistines heard that the sons of Israel had gathered at Mitzvah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel, and when the sons of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. Then the sons of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Israel gets it. Israel gets it. Israel, when they're scared, they told Samuel, Do not cease praying to our God for us. Do not cease. What did Samuel do after they said that? He made save us from the hand of the Philistines. Verse 9, Samuel took a suckling lamb, offered it for a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now Samuel was offering up burnt offering, and the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered a great thunder on the day against the Philistines and confused them so that they were routed before Israel. Verse 10. Now Samuel was offering up a burnt offering and the Philistines drew near to the battle against Israel. Nobody in here doesn't already recognize the fact that we've already had our burnt offering. Our priest, our prophet has already offered our offering, hasn't he? God will fight our Philistines. 
God will battle our Philistines. He'll wage our war. But he's not going to change his mind on how he does it. Malachi 3.6 says, I have not changed. And because of that, you have not been consumed. But then how you ask, how do I approach you? Our lamb has been sacrificed. The battle is the Lord's. As we went through the week, and as we go through next week, remember that our prophet has sacrificed our lamb. And God has promised to fight our Philistines. But we have to put everything away. Israel understood. They understood what they needed to do. They needed to put everything away, and they needed to serve the Lord alone. Can we do that? You bet we can. Is it going to take a lot of work on our part to put in order the things that we've already got going on? You bet it is. And is some of us going to be able to do it quickly? No. <coughs> then the men of Israel went out of Mitzvah and pursued the Philistines and struck them down as far as Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mitzvah and Sheik and Shin, and named it Ebenezer, saying, This far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more within the border of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The hand of the Lord is against your Philistines. The hand of the Lord is against our Philistines. And we also, too, as, Israel, as uh, Samuel did, we have a monument, we have a memorial to remind us of that. I like the Old Testament, and I would have liked the opportunity to see. I like old folklore. I like when men and women tell you about, I was here, and I remember here, and I did this here, and this happened here. That's the way they were built back in, wasn't it? Samuel set up a stone as a memorial, and then called it Ebenezer, because so far the Lord is with us. Our sacrificial lamb has been offered, and the memorial is in front of us. We have three memorials as Christians. We have the Lord's Supper. We all understand that. Do this in remembrance of me. That's to recognize the, the Christ, the Savior's death. We have the waters of baptism. That is to recognize the burial of Christ. Mark 16, 16. Be buried with him in water. And then we have the first day of the week. That is to recognize the church. Christ's resurrection. We are to be blessed that our sacrificial lamb has suffered. That he's been offered. And that the Lord has promised to fight our Philistines. Mark chapter 6 tells us that we're not to worry. Don't worry about what you eat, drink, or what you may wear, for even the Galatians worry about this. But your Heavenly Father will give you what you need. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow's got enough worry of its own. You're going to face another week. I'm going to face another week. We're going to struggle. We're going to challenge. We're going to have people fuss at us and complain. We're going to have people cut us off. But understand, the battle is the Lord's. If we put away are foreign, and we serve him alone. The way into the body, and the way to recognize and respect the death of Christ, is to be a part of him. To be a part of him is through the waters of baptism. There is no other way. The scriptures are clear. The Lord loves you. The Lord has died for you as he died for me. He needs you. If there's anyone here that has the need of the water, we ask that you come as we stand and as we sing. I am resolved no longer to...
highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, He is the just one, He hath the words of life. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee.